I do understand the financial, financial issue, of course, but I believe it should be considered the other way around, that is, how much money might reasonably be expended and then calculating the package which would deliver a magazine or whatever of X pages, Y times a year, to every single member. If not that something, even if it's only a Christmas card, the national core must communicate directly to everyone as part of the spiral that keeps us all part of the whole. And secondly, the tainty repast of U3A's gargantuan feast of a thousand dishes has gorged me and yet at the same time whetted my appetite. There was an American edition of Oliver Twist which tried to heighten its selling power by a very colourful front cover. It showed Bill Sykes' girlfriend Nancy, life in the London stews, having left her rather scantily clad, but counterfactually well endowed, physically, <laughs> while the bill matter read in dripping scarlet letters, Oliver Twist, he asked for more. <laughs> well, albeit in respect of a rather different appetite, I'm asking for more. I'm asking for more members. We know now what in the beginning was uncertain and much debated, that U3A is able to prosper just about anywhere. We have a thousand U3As and there seems to be no shortage of new U3As being established. But we must also be close to the founders' original design based on both American and British research about the older person's perception of regular accessibility that there should be a U3A within five miles or 20 miles travel time of every third ager. With that in mind, it would be appropriate to devote more energy in the immediate future to recruitment. Some of you may have heard me express my mantra that the U3A is very good for whom the U3A is very good. <laughs> I'm as yet unconvinced there is a need for specific as opposed to general recruitment campaigns. There are 13 million third ages in the UK, so there's plenty of scope for com comprehensive approaches to the crusade. We also know that in the most propitious areas of U3A membership, something like one in 10 of the available third ages are members. It could be argued that there are external, social or other factors in some of those districts of high membership, However, having studied and written about this issue at length and for years and having visited or had contact with something like 250, I don't know, lost count, uh, U3As over the last 34 years, I feel able to affirm that the chief factor in flourishing success has been where imaginative and enthusiastic individuals, many of them present here today, have doubtedly decide to grab the challenge by the scruff of the neck and make a triumph out of it. In the U3A story, Thomas Carlyle had it half right when he argued that history was made by great men. He would need for accuracy, in our case, to have the other half, of course, of great women. For great men and great women have seized the initiative in township after township and design great U3A agencies for the benefit of hundreds of third ages. And if it can be one in ten at one place, it can be close to that ratio in many environs. And I think it not unreasonable to propose a four-year plan hatched nationally, regionally and locally to have one million members by the end of the decade. Call it, if you will, my 2020 vision. And thirdly, and echoing a little, I, I'm, I'm glad to say, of, of, of what we heard earlier, I would wonder aloud whether or not it is time the U3A spread its wings a little more widely in terms of the public discourse of its essential values. Of course, both nationally and in some cases locally, its voice has been accordingly heard but with now a, a longish history and a sound base of outlets and adherents, 
maybe the volume should be turned up. The U3A daily demonstrates in action several viewpoints of social value and importance. The two principal ones uh, on positive age and mutual on positive age and uh, mutual aid I have already mentioned and take them now as two examples. For instance, the nation at large, from the general public to its opinion formers and decision makers, has completely misunderstood the character of older age in its modern setting, with parlous consequences for the way social policy is determined, not only in health and social care respects, but across the administrative board. This misunderstanding impinges culturally, still with a negative quotient in regard of older age in many walks of life, including the press and television. One constant of U3A is the belief that a normal ageing society is a wholesome one. A significant aspect of this is the theme of ageism or age discrimination. The U3A is one of very few organisations that refuses to use birthdays as gateways to access to activities or services, believing that such practices are arbitrary in the same way as our judgments based on ethnic, religious, gender, sexual orientation or disability grounds. I was sitting next to Peter Laslett on the platform when some blameless innocent proposed we should have a minimum age limit of 55. Peter was close, close to apoplectic <laughs> and his pyrotechnic attack was riveting as he, the man who had introduced the three-stage division to Britain, finally asserted the whole point of using the first, second and third age device was to avoid the pernicious usage of birthdays as signifiers that were often unsound, discretionary and negative. Michael Young rightly saw that ageism was not just applicable to older people. About the turn of the century at the British Association National Conference in Swansea, he argued that one's birthday should be private and subject to the data protection legislation. <laughs> Think how often you are asked capriciously to state your date of birth. And he listed dozens of whimsical uses of birthdays for official and allied reasons. Starting school at five is just as capricious as stopping work at 65. Should we then be promoting the justice of anti-ageism abroad rather than merely practicing it privily amongst ourselves? Next, it's intriguing that the nation that comes nearest to operating its education system on U3A lines is the one that has been for many years the highest ranked in Europe for reading, maths and science. The Finnish National Board of Education states unashamedly that at the heart of what it is doing, and I quote, and for those whose Finnish is a little rusty, I'll translate, the joy of learning, that is their strap line, that is their aim, that is the test of what they do. The play way, the discovery method is extensively deployed and the no, there are no formal tests or examinations until students are 18, not a one. Streaming, competition, choice, selection, privatisation, league tables, all outlawed. Having hit upon a more satisfactory strategy of educating people, should we keep that to ourselves and let further generations of children as well adults be abandoned to outmoded, ineffective and worst of all, boring methods? Perhaps the time has come when we should start to preach as well as practice. I return to our foundations. Faced with what we felt to be the challenges and misunderstanding of the time, your founders sought a working model of activity which would demonstrate to the broader community that older people could invent their own destiny and that cooperative involvement was a valid 
social answer. And I offer these three roads ahead in a genuine spirit of admiration and delight that this has been achieved and in the hope of sparking debate about how we might extend these concepts more readily. We are in the happy position of having effectively put our beliefs to the test and our creed into everyday action. It seems like many years ago now that in a very deserted and isolated part of one of those Eastern European uh, Soviet controlled uh, republics, there was a collective farm and the uh, regional agrarian commissar visited this collective farm right where in the outback miles from anywhere very isolated and he questioned the chief peasant of the collective farm he said to him comrade peasant what has the potato harvest been like this year ah oh, comrade commissar said the peasant the potato harvest this year has been magnificent. The potato harvest this year rises from the very soil of our motherland, high, high, high into the sky, even into the lap of God himself. Very good, comrade peasant, said the commissar. The state will reward you, but there is just one small point. It has been safely and securely ascertained by the empirical and puristic application of the Marxist-Leninist principles of dialectical materialism <laughs> and economic determinism that there is no God. <laughs> no, comrade commissar, said the peasant simply, and there are no bleeding potatoes. <laughs> How, how frequently are in public life the promises and claims and statements lofty and the results parlous? That chasm between the pretentious theory and the negligible outcome has not been for us. We took a good theory and made it work in practice. Friends? We are a thousand U3A strong. That is our reality. And that is an enormous amount of nourishing potatoes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I do feel that um, our NEC meetings for the next year uh, have their agenda, <laughs> because I was madly writing down his three points. So we will see what we can do. But thank you so much. It's been so much appreciated. Thank you. Right, and the last person who would like to just have a word with you is our new CEO, Sam Morga. Um, Sam, <laughs> uh, Sam didn't actually, she wasn't looking for a new job. Uh, I'm not quite sure how we got her, <laughs> um, but we did get her. And uh, she is very experienced in the charity um, sector. So we are very, very lucky to have her. We had wonderful Lynn, and I think now we have wonderful Sam. Uh, so I am sure you will be very happy to hear what she has to say. Thank you.
So, um, hello everybody. Um, it's a, a real privilege and I am so excited to have the opportunity to being in the position of Chief Exec of the Third Age Trust. Um, I've worked in the voluntary sector for over 20 years, always with older people, vibrant, energetic older people just like you. And I spent a lot of that time campaigning for a better world with older people. And you are the better world in so many ways. And it's fantastic to be able to have this opportunity to work with you, such a wonderful group of people. And I've met many people in my first couple of months in this role. And I've been inspired by so many of you, so thank you. I wanted to say a few things about um, the U3A and its impact on society. Um, in addition to celebrating the success of having a thousand U3As, the U3A movement itself achieves an awful lot for the society it works in across the United Kingdom and makes an enormous contribution to the quality of life. One of the aspects that troubles many older people is loneliness. A WITCH report recently cited that half of all people aged over 75 live alone and one in 10 people aged 65 or over say they are always or often feel lonely. And that's just over a million people. That's a lot of people who feel lonely. All kinds of causes of loneliness, bereavement, a big change with retirement, lack of contact with friends and companions, and sometimes through people because people can't get out through illness. And organisations who work with older people regard loneliness as a health problem as well as a social one. A lack of social connections is a risk factor for early death, which can be compared to smoking 15 cigarettes or more a day, and is worse for older people than obesity and physical inactivity. Another grim factor is depression, and the Royal Society of Psychiatrists say that one in five older people living in our community suffer from depression. Causes include painful events such as the loss of a loved one or dealing with difficult situations. Physical illness increases the risk of depression. An untreated depression is the leading cause of suicide amongst older people, with men living alone, particularly at high risk. As well as the emotional impact on retired people from loneliness and depression, there's the impact on the NHS in supporting people in managing these conditions. So what helps? Well, the Royal Society of General Practitioners' advice includes interventions to include social participation, physical activity, continued learning and volunteering, which is a good description of the U3A. So in fact, the U3A saves our society a huge amount of money and resource because actually you prevent, together, people feeling lonely and people feeling depressed. And that's important. It's an important contribution that by being together that we are actually making for our society throughout United, the United Kingdom. The Mental Health Foundation says that friendship is a crucial element in protecting our mental health. We need to talk to our friends. We want to listen when our friends want to talk to us. Our friends can keep us grounded and can help us get things in perspective. It is worth putting effort into maintaining our friendships and making new friends. Friends form one of the foundation of our ability to cope with the problems that life throws at us. So friendship is important. And where can we find new friends and new communities of interest? Well, in 2008, there was a campaign which was aimed at uh, saving cuts to adult education at the time, and many organisations took part, including U3As, and that's when I first came into contact with U3As, trying to save opportunities for adults to get together and learn things. So at a time when many retired people said adult education was somewhere they could go along and meet people back in 2008, there weren't many places you could go as an individual to go and meet people. Adult education 
was being closed down. But the U3A continues to provide that opportunity to come together and learn things. You can go on your own. You can go and meet people by yourself. It's an opportunity to go out and engage with other people and in new ways and learn new things. And the strap line, learn, laugh, live, is evident in groups up and down the country. Again, another way which we are making a significant difference to our communities. Turning to the points that Eric made around equality, I feel so strongly about equality and about the respect that is due to older people as they age in our society. Because as Eric said, age means nothing at all. It's our contribution that we make to each other and the society we live in. And many retired people that I've worked with over the years hate the stereotyping that is often displayed in our media. In 2015, The Guardian said, today's films and TV shows are still filled with age stereotypes that are often harmful and demeaning. And a typical stereotype, they said, was of being computer illiterate. Yet, they found, reports have showed that older generations are increasingly tech-savvy, with 36% of retirees regularly using YouTube, 24% using Skype, and a further 54% using Facebook regularly. One in 10 opt for, opt for WhatsApp as a messaging platform of choice to stay in contact with friends and family. Over half of people get their daily news for electronic devices, and more and more are turning to online dating as opposed to more traditional methods of meeting people. <laughs> Indeed, we have among us today uh, Fred Jarvis, who is collating contributions for his blog, and he is part of the Merton U3A, and asked me to particularly remind people that he's interested. So if you've got contributions to make about life in the U3A, please contact him, and he's sitting down over here. In the U3A, people are respected and expected to share their talents, enthusiasms, and experiences. They are hungry to learn. They are hungry to live new experiences because age holds no bar for members. There's no stereotyping on what someone could or indeed should do. The movement is based on equality. Those that teach and those that learn are all valued. And as Eric has said, that is so important in our today's society the importance that every, of for everyone to be respected for what they do, no matter who they are, is actually crucial, and it's a beacon that we should wave. And finally, a short word on communities. In the wake of austerity and cuts to public services, policymakers wanted to identify those opportunities to maximise the value of communities. And the Royal Society of Arts and its partners, the University of Central Lancashire, and the London School of Economics undertook some research to look at the values of communities. They saw that social relationships have a value, which is now called the well-being dividend, and they found social relationships are essential to the subjective well-being and life satisfaction. Their research found that social connectiveness correlates more strongly with well-being than social or economic characteristics, such as illness, unemployment, or being a single parent. So by being together actually improves people's well-being. So we find that the University of the Third Age is of enormous value, not only to this movement of, of uh, 380 plus thousand people, but also by its tremendous impact on society at large. It challenges loneliness, it challenges the causes, the causes of depression, it challenges stereotyping, and it promotes equality. And it builds communities. So important for us to build communities up and down the country. The U3A is a movement for the future and a model of life for all people as they retire. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody was given the opportunity to know about a U3A as they came up to retirement. So thank you for all of your work and all that you do in your communities just by being you and meeting together because you show policymakers up and down the country 
how to live, learn, and laugh. And I have to say, I have a challenge, because as Eric said, we've got to get to a million uh, members by 2020, so I have my work cut out. But not only that, we're going to be a million members of anarchists. So actually, <laughs> even more work to do, it sounds. <laughs> But I want to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here with you. And I look forward very much to the next thousand U3As. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. We look forward to. Uh, now, coming to the end, and I have a lot of thank yous. I will be fairly rapid with the thank yous. Um, don't you think this is fantastic? Yeah. We have to thank Brenda Attlee over there from Chichester U3A. Somehow she managed to carry it in three boxes. I'm not sure how, I don't want to know how, but the result is wonderful, so thank you, Brenda. I thank you all for coming, because this day would be nothing without you, and as I know, it has been a struggle for some of you. I thank our speakers, Baroness de Souza had to go early, uh, but I think Eric's words of wisdom will stay with you for a long time. I thank all the helpers today, uh, the training and development team who've been raked in uh, to help, and above all, our national office staff. You probably think that I organized all this. Well, <laughs> Um, I had a great deal of input, but I didn't do anything, um, and they have done it all. It's a very small staff, but their output is enormous. And we really, I, if people don't know the National Office staff, I can tell you that they are the most fantastic bunch of people who do anything you ask them to and do it quickly. So we have a huge, huge debt that we pay to them. Thank you again for coming. Please travel home safely. Thank you all very much. I hope it's been a day to remember. Thank you. Thank you.